We're going to begin this morning uh, into this this new narrative series uh, based on the Sermon on the Mount. But if you, I I want you to remember this because I I believe it to be absolutely vitally true, and I think it's missed by so many people, especially in the church world or in the in the quasi Christian environments that that are promoted these days. It's this: the Bible's dangerous. The Bible is dangerous. The Word of God is dangerous when context is ignored. When you ignore the context of of all of this, right, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because what we begin to do is we begin to take this, this, what is intended to be foundational truth, compass calibrating for life application word and reduce it to a series of anecdotal sayings that bring limited knowledge and temporary comfort without allowing it to do its deeper work of transformation in our life. I just said a lot. Because I love you that much. So we're going to slow walk some of this so that we can grow through this. Right? Why is context so necessary? Why is it so vital? Why is it it so important? Because of Westboro Baptist. Right? When you see people who claim the love of Jesus uh, spewing hate all over the place, you're like, how does that even measure up? How How does this measure up? Right? We see the polarity being lived out in our real-time moments on all ends of the spectrum because context is ignored. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about context. It might seem a lot like history today for a moment, but I hope you'll lean in because it's for your good. Right? That's how it's intended. It's for your good. It's not intended for your entertainment. It's intended for you to be equipped. Because without context, without intentionally digging in so that we can understand the truth, we don't know how to apply it accurately, right? So don't take my word for all this stuff. I hope that you'll study yourself because I think that always matters. But truth requires context, right? Have you ever had somebody tell you a truthful statement in a mean way and not give you context for understanding? Right? Because see, here's, here's, the, here's the deal. Truth, truth without context, truth without context is absent of grace. So all truth and no grace is cruel and abusive. All grace with no truth is false and enabling. Right? So you, you, you've got to have this, and this is what's so beautiful about the Word of God. I mean, it's absolutely astounding in its beauty. It merges these two incredibly powerful forces called grace and truth, and it's called love. Amen. Right? It's love. So, anyway, I'll try to get on with it. The Bible is written in covenant language. You should know that. You should understand this principle that pins all foundational truth in context to the Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament, covenant language is the context of the Bible. So what does covenant language mean? Covenant, you right, when you get married, I, I, I talk a lot with, with any couple that I'm going to marry. I say no to a lot of request for me to do weddings but the ones that I do say yes to 
we're going to talk about what it means to be in covenant. And we're going to go back to some of these pinning covenants and where they originated. But there's, there's two types of covenants in the Old Testament. And there's five covenants, primary covenants, in the Old Testament. We'll talk about that briefly. Hang on, it gets better. I know it sounds like history. But if you had boring history teachers, I apologize. There's two kinds of covenants written in the Old Testament. One is called a suzerain vassal or a suzerain treaty. That covenant can be identified by one particular word, the word if. The word if is, is covenant language in the Old Testament and in the New Testament because it's a pinning word that is a conditional clause, meaning if this, then that, right? So you, you can begin to see it as it works out in the suzerain vassal or treaty. Meaning, there are options for blessings based on conditional acceptance and embrace. We don't like that because, see, the Bible is dangerous without context because most of what we have been watered down to believe is that there are no ifs that matter any longer. And then, Pastor, that's a good word. Boy, it stings like antiseptic, but it's cleaning my wound. Thank you, Jesus. The second type of treaty or covenant in the Old Testament is a royal grant. A royal grant is this. It means that when a king would speak a royal grant to his people, the people were the beneficiaries regardless of their it wasn't conditional upon them. It was a promissory note on behalf of him who spoke it, right? Those are the two types of covenants that all of this rise and fall on. Now, why does that matter? Because you can't understand the New Testament without having a working knowledge of the Old Testament. The New Testament is Old Testament contained. The Old Testament, which we're going to see in this series, the Old Testament is New Testament explained. Right? So the five primary covenants of the Old Testament, the first one is the covenant God made with Noah. It's called the Noahic Covenant, Genesis chapter 9. The second is called the Abrahamic Covenant, the covenant God made with Abraham. And we find it beginning in Genesis chapter 12. But you, you see the narrative work out and you see the interaction with God with these, these people in the Bible crafting of the covenants. And it matters. The third covenant is what we call the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law, right? It's extrapolated from this this dialogue between God and Moses for the people of Israel. And you start to see that emerge beginning in Exodus chapter 19. It's important. The fourth covenant is the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant, God's covenant with David, speaking, beginning in 2 Samuel 7, speaking about the, the future kingship that will always be pinned to the lineage, right? The heritage the heirs of David. Which, by the way, that matters when you start reading the genealogy of Jesus. And then the fifth covenant of the Old Testament is called the New Covenant, or it's called the Christ Covenant. It's the prophetic covenant about the coming Messiah found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Beginning with verse 31. Those covenants mattered. And here's the crazy thing about covenants. The covenants were, were somewhat of a combination between the suzerain vassal and treaty and the royal grants. And, and so when you're reading them, you're like, well, which one is it? Well, the, it's this merging, but it gave context for what would be taking place, right? So in these covenants, there are times where God speaks and says, I will do this. And then there are times that God says, if you follow me, right? When you go and read in Deuteronomy, right? 
There's blessings and curses, blessings and curses. It's just kind of how that works. Now get the, get the framework. Jesus is about to have this incredible interaction with this huge crowd. And the framework for this moment is the last word before the prophets went silent. For centuries, there was no prophet in Israel. There was no revealed word of God for the people. Found in the the book of Malachi. The last word in Malachi chapter 4. I'll just read it. It's good. Check this out. Uh, Verse 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Do you say the word curse? curse? Why? Because that's covenant language. Covenant language is being explained. Covenant language is being spoken. Verse 5 of Malachi 4. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse, saying, my prophet's coming back, prepare the way. That's foreshadowing to why people kept asking, are you Elijah to John the Baptist? Remember all this. It's working together. Why? Because for centuries they've been hearing, are we in the curse? Is the curse coming? What, what, what's happening? What's going on? And then emerges this, this kid from Nazareth that, that they can't keep out of the temple. And he's teaching the adults when he's like 12, right? I mean, this crazy stuff's happening. And, and, and John the Baptist comes out of the out of the wilderness in like camel hair clothes, eating locust and eating honey. And he's like, you guys should all get baptized because you're a little off here. You're missing it. For the repentance of sin, you should get baptized now. They start filling the river. And then John sees Jesus coming and he's like, that's the one you should be following. That guy, follow him. And Jesus comes and he and he's baptized, and, and the Lord speaks in that moment. I mean, they write it down. The Lord speaks about Jesus in that moment, right? And the, the, the Holy Spirit is present in that moment in a way that is like ripple effect in the water. And they, right after that, Jesus goes away for 40 days. Interesting, you should read Matthew. When you think you're having a bad day, the Spirit of God led him to the desert to be tempted. Bummer sauce. Anyway, I don't have time to unpack all that. But here's what I do want you to hear. Jesus begins to gain popularity. And they get to this place where Jesus is drawing a crowd around him all the time. And the last time, a mountain was significant in the narrative of Israel is when Moses went up the mountain and nobody else could go. Jesus begins going up the mountain and invites the crowd with him. Right? And we read these words. It's a dusty day. It's an arid climate. They're all following him, wondering what he's going to say next. They're all following him, wondering what will happen next. They're all interested And Jesus sits down, and the crowd begins to fill in, but but there's an inner circle, an oikos, close to Jesus, circle of influence. Jesus intended to influence a certain number of people deeply close. That's why you should be in a life group. Deeply close. Deeply close. Right? So they're surrounding this. Those that the disciples, and he's 
He's calling them to himself, and the, the crowd gathers around him, and they're all scattered on the hill. And when Jesus begins to speak, there's probably ADD people in the crowd, and they're like, hey, what are we doing next? Hey, it's really hot out here. Hey, right? And everybody else is like, shh, you shut up. And now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, Matthew chapter 5, and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed. Blessed. They would do this. A hush, the ADD kids would shut up then. Silence and leaning in, because covenant is about to be spoken. Covenant is about to be offered covenant right the miracle worker the one where god spoke and everybody heard it the one who came and john who was the most popular person in the in the region in in all of israel at that time in all of the middle east at that time it wasn't it wasn't herod it wasn't the governor that was it, it was it was this it wasn't the high priest, it was John. The revolution had started, and when Jesus gets to this point and they sit down, here's what they hear him say. Blessed. And they lean in, and they're baited. Blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know why Jesus began writing a new narrative, creating a new narrative, speaking the truth of the, of the foundation? He's rewriting how it's been portrayed. Because you had all these religious people and you had this extrapolation called the scribal law that was such a burden and it was so oppressive. And they created this structure that elevated, elevated those who were truly meant to be the servants like it elevated them in an unhealthy way and and by the way churches do that all the time churches and structures always elevate ego and you've got to be careful that's why the bible says the greatest among you will be the servant not the recipient the servant anyway jesus comes to the, the culture and he begins to help them see with truth and clarity what really matters. And he starts writing this new beautiful narrative. And he says to them, blessed, and they lean in because the word blessed, it, uh, the word blessed would give you this understanding. Life is good for you. You're well off in this. You are favored. It evokes the emotion of happy, but it, it's founded in the intrinsic joy, regardless of surrounding blessed. Right? We, we often don't understand blessed because we don't feel it in our circumstances. If your circumstances are the requirement for you to live a blessed life, you will live in a bipolarity of spirituality. If your surrounding circumstances are the requirement for you to live a blessed life, you will live in a bipolarity of spirituality because everything that Jesus came to offer happens in us. It happens in us before it would ever happen around us. And that's the struggle. That's the struggle. So when he begins to say, blessed, blessed are you, poor in spirit, blessed are you, they lean in. And they begin to understand there is a new narrative being written but they would have waited and they would have paused and they would have wondered what's next blessed if you're poor in spirit the condemnation now has to come you're right the condition 
if they're they're waiting for the conditional clause they're waiting for the moment if if right they're like oh man right because that's how covenant language was written it was it was pinning in those ways favor with favor when you're poor in spirit with favor in these moments you're favored in what's true you're favored in what matters bless 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 few weeks ago, I don't remember the date, but I was preaching on Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, it's called the faith chapter. See, th- these people that Jesus is, is speaking to in the narrative of, of the context, Hebrews is the book that brings the Old Testament and New Testament together in covenant with both the suzerain vassal and the royal grant. And it brings it together. It dovetails it with with harmony for us to understand. In the book of Hebrews, it is beautiful and enlightening and difficult and applicational. I want to slow walk that book one day. Verse 13 of Hebrews 11, he's talking about the people of the five covenants we've mentioned and others. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth, meaning they were residents of a different kingdom. They made the trade to understand the kingdom happens in me. Because the covenant is owned in my soul. Bless. Jesus is writing a favorable covenant when he begins articulating a new narrative of pinning truth. Bless. It's so good so powerful it's so mighty Hmm. so jesus goes on and we'll we'll pick up there i'm out of i'm out of time and and i don't want to overload us but this is what happens when you begin reading and go ahead and read on when you begin reading the sermon on the mount when you read chapter 5 3 through 10 here's what we know all of the promises all of the assurances are a promissory note They are embraced in the present and they are redeemed in the future. They're they're a promissory note of assurance in the present. Man, if we could really understand this, folks, I'm just telling you, if we could understand this, peace like a river will attend your way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, because see, Horatio Spafford, the writer of It Is Well With My Soul, he got it. The assurance is present tense. The promissory note is future tense. Redeemed, right? You get it? It's kind of like, I'm not a finance guy, but it's sort of like an IRA. It matters today. It pays off in the future, right? Blessed. That's what we're going to lean into for the next several weeks, and unless God calls an audible, we're going to lean into bless and what Jesus meant and how it applies. Because, friends, if we'll get this, if we'll get this, we will live in the fulfillment and in the freedom that Jesus intended for his followers to enjoy. But I want you to know, I want you to know, by the way, if this is your first time here, thanks for coming, truly. But I want you to know, it will be beautifully painful. 
as we wrestle with the understanding. You know, Jacob walked with a limp the rest of his life after he wrestled with God. But you know what? Jacob always res- loved. I mean, when you read the narrative, Jacob was always grateful for the opportunity to have wrestled and been in that moment, right? That limp became a, that limp became a blessing. Man, I can't wait. I want you six days to go really, really fast. But here's what I want to ask you. As I've been praying and preparing and been thinking all week, and I, and I think about the flood victims, and I think about the earthquake victims in Mexico, which I think it's a tragedy. There's not coverage on that. And, and, and anyway... I'm thinking so often it's these these people are 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 hurting and broken and it's easy to see when the tragedy and crisis arrive about the hurting and broken people. But when there's not a flood or an earthquake it's easy to mask as if we're not hurting and broken. Jesus showed up to a culture that had been confused because the teachers had been misled and then became misleading. And it was a slow progression of of trajectory. I was sharing with the staff this week and the advisory team. You know, you don't have to miss something by much. To miss it by a lot because difference is magnified by distance, right? If you want to go to the North Pole and you're going by magnetic north, which is a compass calibration to a magnetic field, you'll end up north, but you're most likely going to miss the pole. True north is different than magnetic north. Jesus is coming because magnetic north was off and the distance of centuries brought a gap that was so wide and the people were so broken and hurting and he begins to write a new narrative. And this is my question. How many of you in sincerity of your, with yourself before God? And you don't have to answer to me. Because my ego is not pinned on, on results and altar calls. I have an audience of one, and I just want to make him proud by delivering the truth that he gives me the burden to share. So you don't have to answer to me. But I've got to ask you, how many of you are hungry for a new narrative in your life? How many of you are hungry for a new narrative in a part of your story? How many of you are hungry for a new narrative in your marriage? How many of you are hungry for a new narrative in your mental health, your emotions, your, your, your spiritual equation? Because you'll never be spiritually healthy if you're emotionally starving. Jesus came and he sat down on the mountain and he offered a new narrative. And I want you to know... When Jesus shows up, the first word you hear Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Because Jesus blesses. He has the authority. The high priest was the one who would speak blessing. In the, in the rabbinical tradition and Jesus is our high priest and he shows up and he says blessed 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 but you know what the people who went up the mountain they also too had choices to make because not every blessing that's offered is received The 
Bible is dangerous. The Bible is dangerous when context is ignored. I will never try to sell you anything. I will never try to convince you. I will only try to equip you with truth in context for the application in your life which all starts with asking Jesus to write the narrative. Amen? So if you need the Lord to begin writing a new narrative in your life, I suggest you walk up the mountain. Give him your attention. Don't ask all the questions. And begin to tune your ears that they would perk and prick. Lean forward because I promise you, if you will seek him, you will find him. And the first word he will speak is blessed. We'll unpack the rest later, but bless my friends. Father, I am so incredibly grateful for your truth and for your word and for its application and, and the hope that it gives and the sustaining value that it brings and the assurances that are ours that, that have a future reward. Lord, I'm grateful that when we seek you, we find you when we seek you with all of our heart. I'm grateful that when we, when we seek you, you are found. So Father, for our friends in this room, for his, this family that gathers we call the Life Point Tribe, I pray that if anybody's here and their narrative needs, needs rewritten, I pray if their marriage narrative needs, needs a new story, I pray if, if context has become skewed that it can be calibrated by your truth, I pray that they would invite you into these moments into these places, into these stories, into these, these hallowed areas and categories of their life. And that they would settle themselves and calm their anxieties and lean into you, Jesus. And hear, blessed, because Jesus, when you show up, blessing arrives. Blessing arrives. so grateful for you, Jesus. So grateful for your truth. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Listen, in just a moment, they'll dim the lights. We'll sing this song and proclaim it. God does, he'll do it again. He'll do a new thing again. That's exactly what Jesus did in this new narrative. If you're here and you've never embraced the truth, of Jesus, if you've never embraced a, a relationship with Jesus and invited him to this table of your life, Revelation 3, 10, 20, I'll stand at the door and knock. The beautiful image of that is that when you open the door, he becomes the host of your house. Have you ever had anybody over for dinner and you're like, this is a little more than we planned on and it's their gift of hospitality? 
and they show up and things get better. You shove Kim Mahaney over, it's like the most natural thing is breathing air. When Kim shows up, dinner's just better. I mean, you may have cooked it, but she's like, oh, this makes more sense. I'm like, bless you. That's what Jesus does when we open the door. He doesn't come in and turn over the tables. He comes in and brings peace. If you've never done that, that's where the blessing starts. If you have done that and and difference has been magnified by distance and there's a gap, climb the mountain. Get close to Jesus. So many of the people in his audience were doing everything they could to do everything right. But what do you do when right's not enough? Lean into Jesus and hear the word bless. And the spirit of the living God, the spirit of Christ himself, when you ask, will fill you completely. And you will begin to live an inside out blessed life. And we're going to talk about that now. I'll be in the Next Steps room. Would love to talk to anybody about a narrative that matters for you if you need a rewrite. And I can pray with you. Amen. Let's worship in church.